I'm going to seek to be brief, but I'm going to be honest. I sought to offer this speech last night to save us all time because I, I was told that it was futile to go through this process, and, uh, but we, we did. And um, I would like to uh, leave an honest assessment of what I believe has occurred on the record. And I want to set everyone at ease. The goal of this speech is to speak the truth in love. I want to begin with a quotation from Winston Churchill. He said 70 years ago, never give in. Never, 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 never accept to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. This is not the last effort to stop unreasonable searches of our person. I am not giving up. And even if I did, I do not think the people are going to allow the violating of their rights to persist. Providence and the people brought me to this legislature. My race really started without me. When the people wanted a representative who would not represent, who would not only represent their values, but endeavor to keep the oath to the Constitution of the United States and of this state, which Jefferson once said, are chains that bind down elected officials to keep them from mischief. I came to do what was right for the people of my district and of this state. I did not come here for special interests. I have sought to do what former Speaker of the House, Pete Laney, told me early in the session. Do what's right, explain it, and you'll be okay. He also said, don't do anything your wife or your mother, you don't want your wife or your mother not to know about. I've sought to, to live that way the best way I can, and I have made some mistakes, and I appreciate y'all informing me, and, uh, and I'm seeking to, to learn, and I appreciate that. Today, ladies and gentlemen, our greatest enemy is not terrorists that may lurk and destroy from time to time. Our greatest enemy is ourselves. The seeds of anarchy and tyranny that reside, that reside in, the, in each of our own hearts. And if given opportunity and left unchecked, will grow and overwhelm the garden of the rule of law. We must refrain from using that very law to punish wrong, wrongdoers for the general welfare, to be used for only for our team. What I'm getting at is this idea that it's wrong to cheat unless, of course, you're cheating for yourself or your team. We all, no doubt, were aware that when we came to these grand halls, that there would also be within them duplicity and deceit. The challenge, though, is not to succumb, not to go along to get along in order to be reelected, not to be complicit with its corruption. To apply this to the legislature, let me give you several examples. In one sense, this first example is very insignificant, but in another is symptomatic and indicative of why the people do not trust politicians. Now, all of us freshmen learn pretty early that we don't have to hurry to the chamber, as also Pete Laney one time told me, because it is unlikely, it is likely that time will stand still. He didn't say that. Those are my words. I had never seen a legislative clock before. So this was new to me as, and amazed me as a freshman as I hurried to the house floor and then I saw it stand 10 o'clock, 5, 10, 15, and, and however long until the speaker called the house to order. Sometimes it was a few minutes, sometimes it was a great while. Why is that? Well, I believe it's because the house rules dictate that the speaker shall take the chair 
on each calendar day precisely at the hour which the House adjourned or recessed at its last sitting and shall immediately call the members to order. Amazingly, the journal records that we all come to order precisely at the appointed time. We appear to be keeping the rules by stopping the clock. However, in order to appear to keep the rules, we bear false witness and we break the ninth commandment. Which is more important? I'm not only fed up with the TSA and its humiliation of travelers, but I'm also fed up with phonies, especially phony politicians who seek to take credit for legislation that they at the same time are seeking to kill. Let me give you a second illustration. The most disappointing day of this session or the regular session for me was when I heard the ruling from the parliamentarian and the person in the chair at the time concerning the local and consent um, rule of the placement of items on the calendar which involved the expenditure of state funds. And there were several bills that grew government by a number of FTEs and spent plenty of state funds. It was such a disappointment to me because, as I said at the time, I believe that I thought I was in D.C. I was seeing Washington here in Austin. You could, by the ruling that was given at the time, place the whole budget on the local and consent calendar because it has to be but balanced. It takes in as much as it spends. And in a sense, the fiscal impact would be zero, as the, those bills indicated, even though they did expend funds. Closely aligned with this is our rhetoric, rhetoric about a conservative budget. Now, I wholeheartedly support not raising taxes and shrinking the size and scope of government. But let's tell the truth about the budget. Me thinks we boast too much. Some are touting that we have not raised taxes and have not used the rainy day fund, but let's be honest about it. We are deferring $4 billion into the next biennium. Is that conservative? Is using tax speed ups conservative? On a normalized basis, if you discount the $12 billion of one-time federal stimulus funds and you add in the money that we use from the, uh, reg and the rainy day fund to cover the shortfall in this biennium, I believe it brings the 187 to 175 and then you add back about 3.4, so about 178.5 billion or so. We passed a budget of 172 billion, but we are planning on using the rainy day fund when we come back. And we're not funding Medicaid for the whole 24 months. We're making deferrals and we're using speed ups. And if you actually just normalize the basis, you take out the one-time stimulus funds, actually we've increased the budget by $1.5 billion approximately. And we have not kept up with the enrollment of our schools. We are funding our schools a little bit more, but not on a per capita basis. How can it be right to preserve approximately a half billion dollars of handouts to special interests, including commercials for Fortune 500 companies? We put them before our children, before our students, before the coming workforce. When I supported the abolishment of the Emerging Technology Fund, I was scolded and told that if I wanted to come back, that I better, in a sense, these are not his words, but this is what it, this leader of our state said, uh, in a sense, we've well, got to keep taking pork back to the district. Well, the majority in my district don't want more pork more handouts for special interests. They want a level playing field. They want us to enforce the rules, punish the wrongdoer, and to get out of the way. 
They want us to protect individual freedom and responsibility. And that is why I'm here. As long as there is tyranny, we must ever seek to oppose it. First in ourselves and then in state government. And finally in the federal government. Let's tell the truth about the budget, about the bills on the local and consent calendar, about the funding of commercials instead of our teachers and students. Laws should be difficult to pass. I'm not dismayed that the failure of my bills to stop the, the groping of innocent travelers and seeking people seeking access to public buildings. I'm grateful to have gotten to know many of you as I've knelt beside your desk to talk to you about the need for protecting the dignity of these individuals as they travel. I think most of you are thoroughly convinced that this tyranny needs to stop. Let me pause here to say, you know my heart on this matter. Tyranny is not a political or partisan issue. It is unfortunate that this legislation has been used as political fodder by anybody to adapt the present Obama administration. The TSA and its policies were initiated by the Bush administration and without restraint they continue to grow and they are, so that this present administration can, continues in a similar fashion. It is time that we stand up for individual rights, not just state rights. Now I'd like to talk about a story simple enough for children to understand. It is the story of the emperor's new clothes. Our emperors in Texas still have clothes. However, I, th I think they may be going through a body scan. Politics have a lot in common with fairy tales. In both arenas, you have to suspend rational faculties in order to comprehend what's going on. What is portrayed and what is actually happening are often very different. On Friday, after calling the Texas House of Representatives to order, declaring a quorum present, and making a few brief announcements, the House was adjourned without an opportunity to lay before the House its scheduled business, scheduling the legislature, which was House Bill 41. Recently added by the governor to the call for the special session that prohibits the intrusive touching of persons seeking access to public buildings and transportation. This is the same legislation requested by the lieutenant governor, the state Republican executive committee, and a deluge of grassroots activists to be added to the call. A nearly identical bill, House Bill 1937, was passed unanimously through this House during the regular session. The bill has over a hundred co-authors, at least at my last count. It was passed out of the committee and placed again on the House calendar by the leadership team the Speaker chose. What is the objection of some? They object to the words being used in legislation to describe our private parts of our body. Specifically, the legislation prohibits the touching of the anus, the sexual order, organ, the breast, the, or buttocks of the individual as a part of a screening search without probable cause. God made these parts, and they're sacred, and they're special. And they should not be touched except under special circumstances. There's a specific reason those words are in this legislation. Even they happen to be those sensitive and private parts of the traveler that the TSA agents are routinely groping and sometimes in retaliation for simply opting out of a virtual naked body scan. The bill could prohibit the touching of your nose, your ear, or kneecap, and those would be easier body parts to talk about in public, but it wouldn't solve the problem. I fear the emperors in our state, at least at times, are people who would rather talk about opposing federal tyranny and violation of our individual rights rather than stop the despicable behavior They'd rather not have to describe it, but they're content to let it go on. 
In the name of the security, travelers are being required to submit to a virtual naked strip search of a scanner. Should one oppose the scanner based on modesty or for health reasons, then the result is a humiliating, groping hand search, which includes touching and sometimes hitting or hard pressing the most private parts of an individual's body. As the chairman, Barry Smitherman, said to Fox News in this very chamber. But will it stop here? The TSA claims in public records to have the authority to require a strip search as a condition of travel. In fulfillment of that belief this week, or last week when it was re first reported, a TSA agent forced a 95-year-old woman with leukemia to remove her diaper in extensive and extremely intrusive search. Fifteen years ago, would you have believed that allowing government agent to put your hand inside your underwear would be a condition of travel? If we do not stop now, what will our children be required to endure? A delicate matter, yes, certainly. But it is better to define what is indecent for government behavior, what is government, indecent government behavior, and to prohibit it by legislation than to simply be discreet and allow official oppression of travelers to continue. Rarely in the history of this legislature has, to my knowledge, the state's leadership so masterfully worked against the will of its members and the people they represent. Leadership managed to arrange it so that every member could cast a vote in support of a bill which they ensured would not pass. No doubt this deception will confound many Texans. But the people of Texas should not be confused. The explanation is simple and clear. The defeat of this bill can be only laid at the feet of the leadership of this state. However, this is a victory speech. The people in support of this bill have, have succeeded shining a light on those who collaborate with the growing tyranny of our federal government. I am grateful to my colleagues, my constituents, many grassroots supporters in this state from all over, and even the nation. Providence has used to bring this bill this far. The people now know that it is possible to fight back. In this case, sense, there is a great victory, like at Goliad and the Alamo. In this sense, we do celebrate today. May God help us to restore the Texas that Sam Houston fought for and governed. A Texas that will not submit to any tyranny, come from what source it may. Not to the tyranny of an out of control Republican or Democrat federal bureaucracy such as the TSA. And not to the subtle or overt violations of the rules of morality in its own state government. We need a Texas that will lead by example. May God grant us another San Jacinto in our own hearts, in our families, in our state, in our nation. I move that these remarks and those earlier in the debate be placed in the journal. Members, you've heard the motion. Is there objection? Chair is none. So.